Let's compare memory models between Java and C++. Let's imagine I have some student class that has an instance variable of type string called name. In this Java code here, I'm creating a new student object. I'm creating a new object of type student. And it has a single instance variable, let's call it name. That's of type string. And this is actually a reference to some string object representing the name Nima. And then I have a reference called S1. It's a reference of type student. That's referring to this student object. So this is a reference and this is an object. This is a reference. This is an object. In C++, however, let's run what seems to be equivalent code, but turns out to do something much different. So first, let's just look at that first line. I'm creating a new string object, or a new student object, sorry. This is a new student object. And within it, I actually have an instance variable, which is an object of type string storing the name Nima. So this is a student object, and this is a string object. And this string object is called S1. So in Java, when I created this object, I was actually creating some object, and S1 was just a reference to that object. In the C++ version, S1 actually is the name of this object itself. S1 is not a reference to an object. S1 is the object. So let's go back to the Java example and run the second line. So now student S2 equals S1. In Java, what this does is it creates a new reference, we call it S2 of type student. And it's saying whatever object S1 is referring to, S2 should refer to that same object. So S1 is referring to this object. So now S2 is referring to the same object. And again, S2 is a reference. So in this example, S1 and S2 are both referring to the exact same object in memory. If I modify this object through S1, S2 will be updated as well because S2 is exactly referring to the same object. Let's run that second line of code in C++ though. So in C++ what this is doing is it's actually creating a copy of S1 and making that new object be called S2. So when I'm doing this assignment, I'm actually creating a brand new student object, a completely different new student object. And I'm calling it S2. And it's a copy of the student object that is S1. So it's going to have name, which is a string object storing the name Nima. So again, S2 is a student object and name inside of here is also a string object. If you're coming from Java, you've probably heard the term reference, but I wanna emphasize that a C++ reference is completely, completely, completely different from a Java reference. So temporarily, just forget everything you know about Java references. That'll be in, uh, helpful information in the future, but not right now. Uh, for C++, references are basically another name for the same exact object. So let's work out this small code example. We have some student class that has an instance variable of type string called name. So in this first line, 
I'm creating a new student object. It's going to be student object. It has an instance variable that's being initialized to be the string Nima. And this object is called S1. So now the first line of code is done. I created a new student object. Inside of it, the instance variable is a string, oh, sorry, string object. And this object, the student object is called S1. So now on this line, I'm doing student ampersand S2 equals S1. So ampersand is our way of creating a reference. We're not creating a new object, we're creating a reference. So what this is saying is create a new reference to the object that is S1. So S1 is this student object. S1 is a name for the student object. And this is basically saying, hey, let S2 also be a name for this exact same object. So what this would look like is this. S1 and S2 are both this exact same object. They're two different names, two ways of calling this precise object. Then on the third line, I do student S3 equals S2. So remember, this is now an object. I don't have an ampersand, so it's not a reference, it's an object. So I have to copy S2 into S3. S2 is a student object. It's the same one as S1, it's a student object. So I'm creating a brand new student object. It has a name instance variable. And I'm copying the one that is in S2. S2 is this object, so this is its instance variable. And now S3 is the name of this totally different brand new object. So I have two objects, but I have S1 and S2 both names of this object, and I have S3 as the name of this object. Let's talk about pointers in C++. If you're familiar with references in Java, this is now where they come into play. A C++ pointer is extremely similar to a Java reference. So let's take a look at these lines of code. This first line, let's say I have a student class that has an instance variable of type string called name. I'm creating a new student object, creating a new student object, and its instance variable of type string, which is called name, is storing the string object Nima, and I'm calling this object S. So now this next line, there's kind of two key things that we have to take away. This star here, this is how we denote a pointer. I'm saying this is type pointer to student. It's something that will point to a student object. And generally speaking, this here, this ampersand, let me fix that a little bit. This ampersand is saying, let me get the memory address of whatever I'm in front of. So a pointer in C++, just like a reference in Java, it's a variable that stores a memory address of some object. So what we're doing here is we're saying, create a new object that is type pointer to a student. So I'm going to say this is my new object. It's type pointer to a student and store the memory address of S. S is this object. I get its memory address. I store it into here. Let's say this memory address is at like 9500, for example. This is not the name of it, this is the memory address. Uh, let me clarify that. This is the memory address of this object. It's not another name for the object. This is the memory address. What this would do is actually store the memory address of S into this object. We as humans don't like thinking in these terms, so let's not even think of this actual number 
Let's instead think of it as being an arrow to this object. Student pointer is an arrow pointing to this object. Similarly, I can have a pointer to a pointer. So the way I would read this is this is a pointer to a pointer to a student. So I create a new, oh, I'm sorry. And this one was called PTR. That's the name of this object. So here I'm creating a new object of type pointer to pointer to student. I'm calling it PTR PTR. And what am I storing in there? I'm storing the memory address of whatever pointer is or PTR. PTR is this object. I'm getting its memory address and I'm storing it here. So now this is pointing to this object. So it's a little bit weirder than Java where Java references only refer to objects. In this, pointers are objects. I can have a pointer pointing to a pointer if I want. I can have however long of a string of this as I want. If I wanna access something, so for example, let's say through pointer, I wanna access this name instance variable. I can do this in two different ways. One, I can try dereferencing dereferencing my pointer. So what this would be is, let's say I could do star pointer. So if I put the star in front of it, this is saying dereference pointer. So follow its pointer. So now by doing star pointer, I'm actually talking about this object here. And then I want to access the name instance variable. So I dereference, so I follow this arrow. And while I'm now at the object that the pointer was pointing to, access the dot name instance variable of that object. The other way, I mean, this is really still dereferencing, but like, I don't know what you would call it, but arrow dereferencing, I'll call it here. Dereferencing. It's pretty much the same thing, but I can use a hyphen and a greater than sign so it looks like an arrow. And what this is saying is access the name instance variable of whatever I get after I dereference pointer. So think of it as like this is the arrow. I'm saying pointer and then the name instance variable in that object. So these two lines of code are equivalent. This is just generally considered a somewhat cleaner way of doing it. Memory management is quite different in C++ than it was with Java. In Java, any non-primitive object would be automatically destroyed by the garbage collector the moment it was no longer accessible. But in C++, that's no longer always the case. Let's take a look at this example. So here I have a student object that I've created that has an instance variable of type string called name and I'm setting it to Nima. So I'm creating a student object. Its name instance variable is the string Nima and it's called S1. This is automatic memory allocation. I've created this object on the runtime stack. And I know that I did this because I did not use the new keyword. I'll get to the new keyword in a second, but basically if I create an object like this without calling the new keyword, it's created on the runtime stack. And the moment the method in which I created it uh, returns, this object will automatically be deallocated de for me by C++. So that's excellent. I don't have to worry about S1. The moment this method returns, it's done. What about S2 on the other hand? So when we use the new keyword, this is, oops. so this new keyword is dynamic memory allocation. So at runtime, I'm creating this arbitrary new object that exists somewhere in memory. I'm gonna create this new student object. It has a name instance variable an object of type string, and it's called Ryan. 
or and it has the uh, string Ryan. And now the new keyword, it dynamically allocates the memory needed for this object. And what it returns is the memory address of the resulting object. So this new object's memory address gets returned and then gets stored in this new variable S2. So S2 is a variable of type pointer to student, and it stores the memory address of this new object that was created dynamically using the new keyword. Because I created this object using the new keyword, it will not be deallocated for me the moment the method returns. It may never get deallocated at all. If I want to deallocate it, I have to explicitly call delete on this object. So I would say delete S2, and it would deallocate the object being pointed to by S2. Delete needs to take in a memory address, AKA a pointer, and it'll deallocate the memory of that object. If we don't manually deallocate every single dynamically allocated object that we created, we'll run into a memory 